Mm. I, said I got no. him. I got him. <laughs> <laughs> all right. That's all right. He's yeah. too shy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. You ask so, me, I'll answer yeah. if you like. Yep. Yeah. yeah. We. I think um, Jivan was supposed to host you. I think he wrote the the message to you about our project, but one of yes. us, yeah, because of he's a little bit busy. So we have our yep. group here, we have our team here, and yeah, so we are here to have a chat with you. Yeah. yeah about what <laughs> about the message that he sent you. So we have a, Yeah, he put a list of questions. I, yeah. I answered them online, but he said you might want to talk about them here. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, we are we are talking about the questions that yeah, the question that he sent you, and then yeah, mm -hmm. we'll be discussing yeah a little bit something different about think, that question. So right, I think the first one was something it was to do with um, there's a rise in Aboriginal deaths in custody. Um, yeah, yeah, that was yep. the first question. I addressed part of that, but I will sort of reiterate one point that when you've got a very conservative government. I found out historically, mm -hmm. when you've got a very conservative government in, you will get a rise in arrests of Aboriginal people. It's mm -hmm. always been the way in Australia. And with the arrests comes the possibility of more death. And if you look, it's also the, it's also the reaction of the, the authorities. When, when authorities get put at threat, they will react violently. Any racist regime will react violently. I'll give you an example. We had uh, campaigned for many years for the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody that uh, started in 89, 1989, ended in uh, 91 or something like that. But when it was first announced um, that the Royal Commission was going to happen, the next year, the rate of deaths in custody went up fourfold. So the police and prison officers reacted in a very violent manner towards Aboriginal people. So it went up fourfold. So uh, the the point the the thing the point there is when these people feel they're under threat, they don't tend to go quietly. They escalate. Around the same, uh, if you get later into that decade, along came the first stint in Parliament with Pauline Hanson who made a living out of being racist against all people of colour, Aboriginal people and Asian people. What happened then, I was up in Queensland where she was based and the assaults on Aboriginal people by white people, again, increased by about sixfold. So when you've got this racist element at the helm or when they're under threat, that's when they attack. If you look now, we had a march today. We had a march today that was in Sydney. Only three people were arrested. There wasn't a lot of violence. But my, the, the insulting thing here is, it's a couple of things, is that um, everybody's up in arms because COVID's on. I can understand people thinking, well, you know, if you uh, gather in large groups, you could be cause infections. But the tragic part is, every weekend around Australia, there's 6,000 more people attending rugby league matches or football matches, sporting events. And they're all over the place. You go to the markets and they're cramped. People on Facebook have sent me photos of markets cramped. Now, if you're going to get a couple of hundred people and disperse them because you feel like it's in breach of COVID regulations, well, they should be shutting down every football game in the country every soccer game, every game. They should be shutting down the market. Now, I'm not asking them to shut down the market. What I'm saying is, um, don't over-police Aboriginal people or supporters when you won't police your own people. If this continues about protests, we will have more people end up in prison and more people at the risk of being killed. Now, the police, there's... There's a lot of underlying factors um, to do with policing. Some of the issues I've had to deal with over the years, some of them have been blatantly horrific. You know, I got shot twice by the police. <laughs> um, that wasn't pleasant. So uh, I spent nine and a half years locked up 
up in Queensland, nine and a half years. And I think uh, three years, eight months of that, I was put in a cage four paces square. Now, a lot of the brutality I was subjected to then, yeah, I survived it, but it was not a survival you'd want to go through. The, the other thing I look at is when I came out, I was a mess, but I went back into activism very quickly and then I went into education. It didn't matter whether I got into education or what, I was still targeted by the police. Later on, I started looking at trying to develop strategies to stop our kids getting picked up by the police. Now, I did run into one commander, and here's, a, here's an important lesson. I did run into one commander who was very well on, on side, um, and he wanted me to talk to new recruits at Glebe as they came out to their first posting out of the academy. So my role was to talk to them so they would see that we were human beings and not just a statistic to raid. Because the sad fact of the matter was in Glebe at the time, our children were under 1% of the Glee population, Glee population, but constituted 11% of the stop and search by police. So I embarked on this, and for over a year, I talked to every new recruit that came out. And the stop and search went down to about 4%, which was still too high because we were under 1% of the juvenile population. What came next was there was an a new commander came in who didn't like me because of the protests I was organising in Sydney at the time. He didn't like me at all. He'd take me to court several times, lost the cases. He came in and I didn't realise he was in charge. I contacted the old fellow I had, the person who was in charge before, and I said, when do you need me to talk to recruits again? And he said, he gave me a number and I rang this fellow up and he said, you will not be setting foot in Glebe Police Station unless you're under arrest. I said, we, we, we've been working on a program to try and keep our kids from being har harassed by the police and therefore reacting and ending up in trouble. And it's been successful. He said, I repeat, you will not be talking to any of our new recruits. You will not do anything. So it's sprung up to over 11% again. So there's, you've got individual people in power who just take it upon themselves to make decisions that are detrimental to Aboriginal people. And that, was, that, was a, that happens all over the country. The same, at the same time, I was, um, I was organising an invasion day march and the police uh, said they needed to talk to me. And I sat down in Redfern Police Station. They said, this march will only go ahead if you're handcuffed to serve to two police officers all through the march. I said, that's illegal. I said, we don't care. That's what's going to happen. Now, if that would have happened, everybody would have went on a right because I'd done nothing wrong. So this is... We're constantly being needled and needled and needled. And then when we react, we're in custody. I have a long history of being locked up for one reason or another. And a lot of the times, after I finished my large prison sentence, the times I got locked after that, I was always um, the subject of harassment by the police. And they could say anything they liked to me. They threatened to kill me on several occasions. And as soon as I reacted, I was locked up. And that's the scary part. Because as, an, as an Aboriginal person, when you're locked up, you've got to think, am I going to come out of this? They might only be holding you overnight, but you, it's always on your mind that you may not survive. And that's the trouble we have. The trouble we have with police at the moment is we have to give a message to our young ones. Don't get arrested or you could be killed. We have to give that message for survival. Invariably, what happens if the police calls a young person over, a lot of them will run. They will run rather than, and that makes them look guilty. Such as the case with TJ Hickey over 10 years ago, about 12 years ago. The police called him over. He was just turned 17. He was on his push bike. He took off. They chased him till they speared him into a fence and he died. Now, under normal circumstances, if a policeman called you over, you'd say, what do you want? What do you want? What have I done? A non-Aboriginal person would be able to say, what have I done? And they would tell them. But an Aboriginal kid immediately sees the police and takes off. And there lays the problem. The problem has been government and police failure to recognise our rights. And it's a huge problem. It's not going away overnight. It's not going away. No. Yeah. Do I need to elaborate on that <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
Did you hear that at all? Yeah. Did you hear it? Yeah, we heard. Oh, right, right. right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for the right. first question. Do I need to elaborate on that as anymore? Anything? I yeah. just wanted to ask one question on the first question, right? Just wanted to ask you another yeah. question. Sure. So the next yeah, okay. So why do you think like indigenous people are more likely to die in prison than non-indigenous people? Well, if you look at the statistics, nationally, more non-Aboriginal people die in custody per head. The problem is, per percentage of population, they're probably seven times like more likely to die in custody. Now, I can only put that down to one thing. The, the issues I was just talking about, about over-policing, the other thing is the pure blatant racism. Now, people, and it's been many years since I've been locked up, but um, I ended up going to university and I worked in education for a, a two and a half decades in tertiary education. But I also ended my working career working in a halfway house for our, our people coming out of prison. And the stories I heard, the attitude was no different from when I was locked up. No different at all. So you're treated badly from, the, from day one. I was, I was 18 when I started my large prison sentence. And the first thing the superintendent said to me, if you look at the walls the wrong way, we'll put a bullet in. Straight away. <laughs> and so that starts off on the hostility. You called every filthy name under the sun day in and day out. What they didn't like about me is I'm fair skinned. They used to say to me, You're not really Aboriginal. I'm like, Gee, that's funny. Yeah, have a look at my family. And they, they resented the fact that I wanted to identify how I am. We don't say Aboriginal at home, we say I'm a Murray. In New South Wales, you say Koori. Up in Queensland, we say Murray. And they say, Oh, you say I'm a Murray. So what's your problem? And they got worse. But I saw first, you know, when you're locked up for nine and a half years, you see the racism in your face day in and day out. The screws actually incite racism between black and white. I've seen that happen. I've laid in a cell and a very, actually, he was, he was an in-law. He wasn't directly related, but he was an in-law. Three cells up for me and they beat him to death. They beat him to death and we all heard it. Now, the white prisoners were allowed out the next day. Aboriginal prisoners were locked up for the next two weeks till we calmed down. So we had to lay there and listen to a brother beaten to death. Now, that wasn't the first time that happened. Not the first time. A play I wrote that was on the Yellow Monday Festival uh, a few years ago, it was called 49 Days a Week. It's about my experiences in prison. Somebody asked me, that was a chilling scene when we heard the main character listening to somebody being beaten to death. Where did you get that from? I said, I, I laid down and listened to it. It's still with me. Now, you know, I'm almost 68. That happened when I was in my early 20s. I'm still suffering up here from it. I'm still suffering up here. Here was a man that I was so close to. I loved like a brother. He was an in-law. I knew all of his family. We were, we were close. And all of us had to listen to him beaten to death because of the colour of his skin and his race. There was no other reason. That's because I know why, because I kept calling him racist names as they were beating, beating him. Now, the official report came that he died of a heart attack. Well, goodness gracious me, you beat somebody to a pulp, maybe they will have a heart attack. But it wasn't the first time. I mean, deaths in custody became a thing more of the 1980s. So people who were locked up during the 1970s would say, look, it was, it was, that, it was that regular. We became almost immune to it. We became desensitised. The, coroner, the coroners used to send a wagon in to take out the body. We were that desensitised, we would just say, the meat wagon's here, I wonder who they're carting out. That's how desensitised we became. Because it was so regular. Now, I know a lot of white people were killed during that time, but geez, a lot of our people were absolutely slaughtered. Absolutely slaughtered. I escaped from prison. I had to get out. I escaped a couple of times. I got shot. 
and then my cousin escaped. He got a shotgun blast to his shoulder. I think the cameras went out. Yeah. Anyway, when he came to in hospital, this was before I got shot. They said to my cousin, we miss you. You survived, you bastard, but we're going to kill your cousin. He's just come out of an operation. He's standing there and said, we're going to kill your cousin. Now, in Aboriginal society, he's not my cousin. He's my brother. And us two in particular, they knew we were, like, he's a huge man. And I'm only short. But we're, in our ways, we were like twins. We're like one person. And they're standing over him when he's in a bad way saying, we're going to kill your cousin. That's, that's disgusting. But they didn't say it that way. They called me a black sea. They said, we're going to kill that little black sea. That's, that's that life as an Aboriginal person. When I was 16, I was in a car. Yes, it was stolen. Fine. But since when there's a kid joyriding in a stolen car that deserved to be shot, I got shot in the leg. They didn't say pull over. They just started shooting at the bloody car. I got wounded in the leg. Nothing was ever done about it. Nobody's ever held accountable. Now, I was wrong. I knocked off a car. But since when does stealing a car give the authority to shoot a person? When I got shot as a jail escapee, they just opened fire on me. They didn't say halt. They just shot, just started shooting. So this is, this is the life we've had to put up with. Now, my, my answer to that is why are we killed in custody? Because they hate us. The authorities hate us. And that's where they can get away with it. If you look at the history of what they now call Australia, the history of Australia, um, they invaded in 1788. That's 232 years ago, I suppose. Um, I don't know how many math is. But in all that time, not one policeman, not one prison officer, has ever been found guilty of the death of an Aboriginal person. Not a single one. Now, I think that's alarming in itself. That's a statistic that needs investigating itself. After all the killings, nobody is responsible. And I think we need to, we need to come to terms with that very fact alone. They can get away with it, so they do it. They do it because they can get away. They know they can get away. For goodness sake, Christopher Hurley was a detective in Queensland. Aboriginal people warned the authorities on three occasions he would kill somebody who was that violent. He killed Mr. Domerty. He, we pushed and pushed and pushed, and he did get charged. But surprise, surprise, he got found not guilty. Not only did he get found not guilty, found not guilty, he got $100,000 compensation for being inconvenient. For goodness sake, he killed a man. He killed a man in the cell. This is why they're doing it, because they know they can. And the abnormal part is, you know, I know I did wrong when I was young, but I, I did a lot of the time in jail for that. If you're a policeman or a prison officer, you can kill somebody, nobody's going to touch you, as long as they're a black fella. So there you go. That's, it's, a bit, it's a bit of tragic, bit of a tragic eye-opener, but that's how it is in this country. Yeah. I'm over here sort of recuperating so I can come back and continue the struggle. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you very have, much. Have a break. Yeah. If, yeah. Um, anybody thank have you. a question, then we go to the last question. Oh. Okay, so so you want to know as um, an, the Aboriginal community in Australia, what are the implications of this phenomenon on the community itself? Well, there's a lot. If you uh, leave, it, leave out just a minute the deaths in custody situation. If you look at, we're under 3% of the population and in some places we make up almost 50%. In the Northern Territory, 100% of youths in juvenile detention are Aboriginal. If you look up at North Queensland, adults take up 90% of people incarcerated in Stewart Creek Prison. That's North Queensland. Now, just look at these, this for a moment. The normal, life, the, the average lifestyle path, you know, and I'm not getting into anybody's preferences here. 
I always believed to each his own. But, you know, people grow up, they get married, they have children, they settle down, have a family, and get on with a career. If you continually lock a group of people up, you break that. You, you stop the ability for people to have a family. You stop that ability. And the other thing is, if people get locked up enough, they come out and they're actually not mentally stable enough. They have families and they're not mentally stable enough possibly to look after themselves, let alone a whole family. So it's a vicious cycle. It's a very vicious cycle. Now, on the average, on any given day, we could make up up to 40% of people incarcerated nationally. If you look at those people nationally, they are taken from their families. They are away from their families. Now, <clears throat> I'd be silly to say not every <clears throat> that everyone is innocent. There are people who are guilty. I've got no problems with that. But to have such a huge amount of people out of a population taken away and put in prisons, the majority of our people in prisons actually are on remand. They have not been found guilty. They are in there for crimes where a white person would get bail. We don't get bail. We do not get bail. People, society will tell you. You walk around and ask white people and they'll say, oh yeah, they all get bail. No, they don't. No, they don't. Tane Chatfield, who a few years ago, according to the screws, he was hanged in his cell. But his father was smart enough to take photos when he came to identify the body. He had skin under his fingernails. He had bash marks all over his face. That boy was flogged and then he was strung up. And they're still saying it's suicide. He had been on remand, refused bail for over two years. That week he was going to trial and his barrister had said, get his new suit ready, he's coming home. Because the police's evidence was they had not one witness. He was charged with a home invasion but they did not have one witness that could identify it was him. Even the people present at the house said, I don't know who it was. He spent two years in custody for a crime that there was no evidence to point to him. So when he is at the point of being released, he's killed in custody. He was just a young man. He was just a young man with a young child. Now, this is the thing. What does his young child do? His young child grows up with the knowledge, my father was taken from me illegally. This is the system we're working with him. Our children know what's happening. Look, I was, when I came out of prison years ago, I was, a, I was a mess. And my whole family knew why. They knew why my nephews and nieces. Um, yeah, just okay. Um, yeah, I guess I had a sign come up. So it's, there's something about a time limit. My nephews and nieces were a little bit worried about talking to me because they, they believed society that I was all mad and crazy and violent or whatever. And it causes friction within my own family because I've been locked up too long. I was able to escape that mentality and I get on well with my family, but there's still some who think, you know, they locked him up for a reason. <laughs> so they might, it's just... It's this madness that continues and it's a crazy cycle. So the implications are severe. If you look at another point that we don't realise, that in the last decade, the incarceration of our women has gone up almost tenfold. Almost tenfold. Those women can't settle down, have babies, whatever. It's breaking, it's breaking our life cycle. You should, um, I think it'd be good, I don't know whether I included in the answers, I might have, um, when I answered in the inbox, but I think I included the UN's definition of genocide. If you have a look at the UN's definition of genocide, the Australian government for many, many years ticks all the boxes. It ticks every single box. We are living under a genocidal regime and had not for, uh, and had for many, many years. And it was, and the thing is, the media is so irresponsible in this country, in, in Australia, none of it gets reported. Did you know, uh, nobody knew, the media didn't report this. An Aboriginal person reported, I put it on my Facebook wall. A young woman was raped in the police cells by the police in North Queensland. 
and then they beat her and threw her out. They beat her up and threw her out. Now, who does she complain to? Who does she go to and say, charge those men? They're the one, the very people who are, who are sworn to keep the peace and law and order were the ones that raped her. But the tragic part is, the sad, and this makes me furious, this is not an isolated incident, not an isolated incident. I had another relative, the same thing happened many years ago. She was actually dragged off the street by a bunch of white boys, raped in the back of a car. They beat her and threw her on the footpath. The nearest building she found was a police station. She went there and she got worse from the police. She got worse. Who do you turn to? Who do you turn to? I remember as a young child, as somebody, you know, as a teenager running around the street, if somebody smashes you up, you don't go to the police and report it. You don't, because you think they're going to kill you. That's the whole point. We're an open target, not just to the police, but to any racist on the street who wants to give it to you, will give it to you, because you've got no, you've got no comeback. I know that from when I was little. I was told that. If you're in trouble, don't go to the policeman. I, know, I remember at school, at school it was funny. You're at school and you're probably only one or two or three Aboriginal people there and all the teachers say, if you get in trouble or get lost, go and see a policeman. All the white kids would come to school and they'd talk about things. Oh, the policeman helped me this, the policeman helped me that. We just, we'd look at each other and say, they're mad. We thought they were mad going to a policeman because all we knew was that if you went to a policeman, worse will happen to you, worse. And they proved it time and time again. So I, I think one of the ways forward, we seriously need to break this police culture and prison officer culture. We've got to break it down. I've often challenged the police. I've said to them on the streets through a microphone, you swore an oath to obey the law, yet you stand by and allow people to assault other human beings. Any one of those hits could lead to a death. Why aren't you arresting your other officers? Why aren't you doing that? And can you do that? You're, you're just as culpable of any death as the person who did it. And until they realise that, until they get that through their thick heads, that they are actually acting criminally, we're going to be a target. So, mm. Thank you very much. Uh, please, I have one question that I want to ask. Uh, do, do, we, yeah. do we have Aboriginal people in the police uh, in the police service or in the prison service? And if yes, what are they doing about this issue? Well, it's difficult. Um, we haven't got a lot. And there's some of us who say you shouldn't join, but I say it would be a good idea if we had more in there to try and straighten it out, but we've had problems there. We've had problems. If you look at uh, a New South Wales town called Kempsey, not so long ago, a young Aboriginal man joined the police and he wanted to make a difference. Now, Kempsey has an old mission where a lot of our people still live on. The white police used to go out and stir out, stir up all the Aboriginal population, stir them up until, uh, you know, there was violence. They'd come back and get the Aboriginal policemen and say, go and arrest them. So as a hobby, they would go and start trouble and they'd expect the Aboriginal policemen who came from that community to go and quell the problem. So that's not fair. I knew, I, when I worked at uni, uh, I was lecturing and I had, and also I worked at Yambana Indigenous House of Learning at UPS um, for years. And uh, I had a student who said, look, um, I want to join the federal police. And I said, well, I've got nothing wrong with that. And he said, well, I just want to... I know your background, you don't like the police. I said, but you've got to have kids like you in there. And, you know, he said, yeah, I want to make a change. I want to, I want to protect our people from the inside. And I said, good luck to you. Well, he didn't even last 12 months. He's come to me as shattered man. And he said, this is the most horrible experience I've ever had. Every day I got called a racist name. Every day. I didn't get to investigate anybody else but an Aboriginal person. He didn't get to investigate a white person. He didn't get to investigate anybody but an Aboriginal person. And he said, you know, I tried to tell him, I'm here as a police person, you know, why can't I do duties of everybody else? And I said, you're a black, so you'll deal with the black. That's all I said to him. So, you know, it's very difficult to be in that situation. It's worse in prison. It's worse because inside jails, you're getting belted a lot. You're getting belted a lot. 
So if somebody turns up, one of your own people in a uniform, well, they're going to cop it. They're going to cop the frustration. So, and it's also sometimes some people who get into these uniforms, it goes to their head a little bit. I know there was a Murray up at home. He joined the prison service. Now, to prove he's as good as the white fellas, he, he went around and he gave us a hard time. It, it was pinching us inside prison for any slight infractions of the rule. Any slight infractions. But his whole, his whole attitude towards us was bad, but it did him no good. He got involved in some fisty cuffs on the outside and he got charged and sentenced to four years jail for a fight. So next thing he's on our side of the fence and we didn't want to know him because of what he'd been doing to us. So it's a very complex argument, that one. The police force works to a degree, but I wouldn't advise anybody to put on a uniform and go into prisons because there's too many of us in there. And most of us have suffered in there one way or another. So it's a hard, hard ask that one. <laughs> no. It all depends what family you come from. Man. Some families are very anti-police and anti-prison officers. Some are a little bit more uh, flexible. Okay. Yeah. Any have anybody have a question? Oh uh, yeah, I have a question. As as you talk about like women's death, you know, like so, what do you think the death rate of women is higher than the uh, indigenous men in custody? Why is it high? You know, higher well, than the well, actually, I, I I said the incarceration rate of women has gone up tenfold. So that's now per head of population, the women's incarceration rate. I'm not sure on the deaths rate. I think uh, men's deaths rate is still high, but certainly the rate women, our women are being incarcerated is absolutely sickening and alarming. Now, I actually think that's a personal act of genocide. That's my own view. And if you look at the thing I sent about, and I'll resend it on to the, um, uh, the inbox of uh, Justice Inbox. Um, the... Uh, Declaration of the UN Declaration of Genocide, it's certainly a factor. If you lock people up, if you take them out of their communities, if you're killing people, you're guilty of genocide. Australia's been guilty of genocide for a long, long time. Now, there's issues I've spoken to just now that you would not read in a newspaper. I don't blame people like that. The, the media, I've really attacked the media in Australia too in my activist years because I think you know, I would, I'd probably trust doing some deal in the back alleys with some, some disreputable person than I would a journalist. The fact of the matter is, if you don't report something, well, authorities know they can get away with doing what they want. When um, the the other other issue we have here, which I've been very critical of, when we have a death in custody, you often get the minister for prisons get out and say to the cameras. There are no suspicious circumstances. So the first word anybody gets is no suspicious circumstances. Society then thinks nothing's wrong here. Now, I've been very critical of that, and I've did radio interviews for a long, long time where I've criticised the ministers for saying that, uh, particularly in the David Dungo case. We've all, I don't know whether you, have you seen the footage of when David Dungo was killed? Has anybody seen the footage? Have you seen the footage of the David Dungo killing? Oh, yeah, I have seen it. I have seen the video. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you see the screws run in and he can't breathe, he can't breathe, and he's dead. Yeah. Well, the Corrective Services Minister, within a half an hour of his death, had front of the TV cameras and said, there is nothing suspicious in his death. Now, that's, that's irresponsible, and that's a, that's a purposeful act because he is telling society his officers did nothing wrong. So that's the end of the story because he's a man of authority. And the journalist didn't even question him. Now, any journalist worth their salt would have said, what time did he did this happen? He would have said, well, a half an hour ago. Well, any journalist would have said, how can you say this without an inquiry? That's the obvious question. <laughs> how can you say this without an inquiry? Now, when I brought this up against this particular minister, I was on Radio Skid Row, Radio Redfin on several occasions on 2SER, and I named the minister. 
And I said, you're either intentionally participating in genocide or you're the biggest moron that ever fronted the cameras. You can't have it both ways, Minister. After I said that, the next time I was at a rally, I was coming home and the riot squad had all finished. The riot squad were down the road and a group of them grabbed me and they said, don't worry, we're going to get you, you black sea, and when we do, we're going to kill you. Now, they said that out loud in front of everyone. There were, this was near Central Station. They said in front of people walking by as loud as you could get. The only reason they said it is because they knew they would get away with it. They knew nobody would report it. They knew if I went to the media, the media would say rubbish or the media would not report it. So they made a death threat against me. The, right, the Sydney riot squad against me, right outside Central Station, nobody's held accountable. That's a scary thing to have to go through. I mean, I was probably 65 at the time. So here I am and now getting a little bit elderly and I've got these young steroid filled hoons standing around threatening to kill me. That's not a pleasant thing to go through. You shouldn't have to lead, lead your life like that. I don't care who you are. So, yeah. That's, uh, and the incarceration rate of our, our women, it, it's, it's intentional. I can only say it's intentional. How can you settle down and have a family and do, or, you know, you may not want to settle down and have a family. You may want to go with, into a same sex relationship. It doesn't matter. How can you settle down and have a normal life when you're targeted to be locked up all the time? And again, one of the important factors here is a lot of our people are still on remand without being found guilty. And when they're found not guilty, it could be up to two years of their life has gone and they're just released without an apology. Nothing. And you're supposed to, after being brutalised for two years, come out and be normal. I remember seeing a doco once. It was an amazing piece of work. It was done by Channel 2. And a good friend of mine was on there. They went inside Parramatta Jail. Now interviewing prisoners. Uh, ABC got permission. And my dear friend, he sat there and he said, look, think about this. They keep you in here for years. They call you every filthy name their tongue can reach. If you object, they will physically bash you. And you do this for year in and year out. And he said, the strange part is, after that, they let you out in the streets. And I thought that was a pretty chilling thing. And it's true. You brutalise somebody and then you let them out in the streets and you expect them to be normal. I'll tell you something that took me a long time, a long, long time after I did nine and a half years to even look like being normal. I had such violence within me, it's a wonder I didn't go back. But, I, you know, I, my cousin and I got out around the same time and we made a pact with each other. We actually said that if we reacted the way the authorities want us, they win. They win. The other point is, if we react the same the way they want us to, innocent people will be harmed. And it's not their fault. They just don't know what, what we were subjected to. So we made that pact. But not everybody can do that. And the funny thing is, my cousin and I were so close that if it was one feeling, one was feeling a little bad, the other one could sense it. We'd go straight over to the other one's house. Comfort them. So if we were feeling uneasy, bang. I just get in the car, I drive over and say, You're right, cuz. Or he did the same to me. You're right. I started drinking very heavy, very, very heavy, because the nightmares were too bad. And I was just sitting around smoking hash and drinking so heavy, I was killing myself. And he got me and he said, You're coming to stay with me for a while because alcohol will kill you. This is what they want. They want you to go downhill like this. So how can you ever? How can you ever fight for the rights of our people while you're drunk all the time? So in February 1982, I stopped smoking hash and I stopped alcohol and I haven't touched anything since. So, and it was, he made sense. How can you fight for the rights of our people in this state? So we used to do this for each other. So we, we had a very close bond, which we still have. We still have a close bond. So, um, yeah, we're just lucky survivors. But not everybody has someone like that. You know what I mean? Not everybody has someone there like that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. And I think our last question will be, uh, we'd like to ask, as a professional and an Indigenous person like you, what do you think yeah. 
the government can do or what do you think can be done to i mean stop this alarming issue yeah well i don't think the government can do anything they've had every opportunity and as i said if you read the declaration uh un's definition of genocide australia is a genocidal country it's just not well advertised i think what we need to do is we need the separation of powers I see, I've been saying this for many, many years. Now, we've got this thing called the Statement for Uluru, the voice and recognition. That's all rubbish. That is all rubbish. Now, I can prove that in one, one sentence. If you have a look at the, one of the main, uh, they're saying this is going to be the big answer to uh, what Aboriginal people are coming. The Statement for Uluru was carried out by people who were selected by the government, not elected by community. That's a big difference. The second part is if you have one of the, uh, a look at some of the main finances, some of them are overseas finances, but one of the big money people in the statement and was with constitutional recognition has been Rio Tinto. You might remember in recent weeks, Rio Tinto blew up sacred sites and got, got nothing nothing happened to them. They blew up sacred sites so they could mine. Now they're funding this thing. Why would a mining company fund something? I'll tell you why they're funding it. So it's a useless bit of work there. Everybody will think everybody's happy in Aboriginal Australia. It's not. When the statement for Uluru, when you, when you have a look at it, I don't know whether you're familiar with it, but when you have a look at it, the only thing it's going to bring about is we will be able to have an advisory committee but it will be selected by the federal government. They will select people that we term as traitors. And there's, a, there's enough of them around that'll take the crumbs off the table and run with the white politicians. There's enough of them around. And, but they'll be selected, number one, so they're not representative of our people. Number two, it's an advisory body. Now, I could say to you, look, don't eat McDonald's. It's bad for you. You don't have to take that advice. <laughs> That's how good an advisory body is. I could say to anybody, don't eat KFC, you'll, you'll end up being obese. People can take or leave the advice. And that's how, that's how ridiculous an advisory body is. So this leads me to the point. We need to have a mechanism where we select, we select or we elect, we elect people from every tribal nation in the country. There's over 500 of them, 500 tribal nations. And out of that group, we then have a peak body which is, is overseen by elders from their own group so they don't get a bit funny. And then we demand that we actually, we have a voice in Aboriginal affairs. We demand. We don't, we don't say we want to be an advisory committee. We want to be a directive committee to take the issues of Aboriginal Australia and we want to be able to solve them. Now, I say this, if, we're, if people are patient because we've been subjected to 232 years of oppression, if people are uh, patient and allow us to make the mistakes we will invariably make, but see in the long term, in five to 10 years time, that we actually do solve some issues, that will be the way forward to say, right, now we take over Aboriginal affairs. Aboriginal affairs, the portfolio of Aboriginal affairs will be run by this elected body. Once we can get to that level, we can say, right, you go your way, we'll go our way. This is our parliament, you're your parliament. The, I've, I've been, you know, you've heard of the Northern Territory intervention, right? But it's a Northern Territory intervention was illegal, totally illegal, done by John Howard, totally fraud. I've been calling for an intervention for years to keep white politicians away from Aboriginal Australia. That's what we need. We need an intervention to keep politicians away from us. That's the intervention we need. We need to have total autonomy and total self-determination. And that means a separation of powers. That's what we've got to head for. It's a long journey, but it won't happen in my lifetime. But I know Indigenous people in Finland had their own parliament. And yes, there's things that don't work quite right, but it's a lot better than what was happening before. So we need that. We need to head towards that direction. That's what I'm telling younger activists today. Head in that direction. Unless we head in that direction, we'll be forever caught in this genocidal grip that we're in. 
happens. And virtually for our kids, it's a horror story. I'm old enough to live with it now, but I feel, I feel very badly for what our kids are going through. Now. I mean, I look back when I was a kid, it was terrible. It was terrible. You want to have a look at the, you want to have a look at Google search of a fellow called Joe Biagi Peters. He's the longest serving Premier in Queensland. He openly admitted his hatred towards Aboriginal people. We had curfews on us. He had martial law against Aboriginal people only. He had everything. And by the time he went through his madness, we were all in jail. We were all locked up. He had the, all the young men in Queensland were incarcerated and were being killed at a violent rate. This is Australia that people, that's in my memory. Now, how do I, when people say, let's reconcile, how do I reconcile that? How do I look society in the eye and say, oh, we'll all live happily ever after? I can't live happily ever after. Now, the reconcile, reconcile is the wrong word. Reconcile, that's another thing the government's doing that's absolutely stupid. You and I have a friendship or a partnership or we're running a business and we have an argument. Then you get a third party to come in and fix it up between us. That's reconciliation. But we didn't have an argument with anyone. We were living a peaceful lifestyle. 1788, they invaded the joint and started slaughtering them. So we can't reconcile. They've got the wrong term. Everything the government does, they do. If you use the wrong terminology, you come up with the wrong idea. Reconciliation is the wrong term to use. Maybe it's walk hand in hand together. I've also been calling for years to tell the truth in history. To tell the truth. I could give you a whole lesson on the history of this country, because I used to teach Aboriginal history at the university. So you had to be spot on with what you were teaching. But I could give you a whole lesson that would shock your socks off at what the invaders did in this country. I'll give you one example. Now, um, you've read books on history of Australia, have you? Has everybody read a little bit? Did you know that all over this country, parents uh, were tied to trees and the babies were buried up to their necks and the troopers used to gallop and bash their heads off. And the parents were tied to watch it and then they attacked the parents with bayonets, they attacked their genitalia and left them there to bleed to death. So their last gasping breath were watching what happened to their children. Now, you can't tell me that we can reconcile that. <laughs> Nobody could ever tell me that. In the lands I come from, the Bidja lands, that was common practice. Before my time, of course. But I have ancestors who witnessed that. So what are we, what are we supposed to do with... with the, what I want this country to do, another thing I want this country to do, tell the truth in history. I don't care whether people are a bit offended about it because people will understand how we got to this situation today. How do I feel like I do today? If everybody knows what happened in history, they'll understand how I feel like this. Maybe I can then talk to people. But I'm to, when I, I've been a lecturer at uni. I talk to people and they think I'm fruit. <laughs> they think I'm crazy. <laughs> Why? Because they haven't been told the full story. Sorry, you were about to say something, yes? You were about to say something. Hello? Were you going to say something then? Were you going to say something? Yes? Yeah, um, Pujay, were you about to say something? Yeah. No, yes? I, just, I, I just wanted I to mention, question. when we talk about yes. the history, the bigger term of like European colonization and then you know a denial of the land denial of the resources and then that brought them to uh, that brought them down to me and um, because they had to surrender themselves so yeah when you when we were talking about the history I was also trying to put out the uh, impacts of colonization that has happened among Aboriginal people and then that has uh, brought the Aboriginal women and then the other people at the uh, margin um, at the very periphery. So yeah, that's what I wanted to discuss about. Uh, well, uh, everything that we broke up a bit there. Yeah, everything, everything about. Uh, we just broke up a bit. I think we have something. Hey, something's happening here. Hello, can everybody uh, hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. I've lost yeah, we sound. can hear you well. Yeah. Hello. Uh, Hello in Zoom land. Hi. Yes. 
Yeah. Hello. I yeah, lost yeah, you for a while. We can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I lost it for a while. Just, yeah. It just froze. Oh, Puja, go on. But that's, a good, that's a good issue because they will give you a sterilised version of history. Of course, the place was colonised and they will tell you that. But it's not so long ago, they wouldn't even admit that. It's not so long ago, they were te- this is what they were teaching. The whites came and Aboriginal people moved further inland. That's what they used to teach. They wouldn't even use the word colonisation. They wouldn't even use the word invasion. And that's not so long ago. And the first rally I ran under the banner of Invasion Day, we only had two or three hundred people there. Last Invasion Day we had 50,000. Now, but that shows you something. That was only in 2013, 2014. People didn't want to associate with the term invasion. And so it's only a recent phenomenon, in my experience, that people have recognised there was an invasion. But they're still glossing over it. What country do you come from? What, what country are you from? What country? Nepal. Nepal. Where? Nepal, right. Nepal. So there's been persecution in your own country. You know. You know that some of the persecution that happened. So uh, we're, I'm talking to a group of people who are well aware of persecution, or well aware of how authorities hide persecution as well. Now, not everybody is guilty. When I went to uh, 1985, the handover of Uluru, there's a lot of white people came. A lot of them came because they wanted to learn firsthand what it's like to be Aboriginal in this country. And they wanted to learn because they're in a sense that the education in their era was the whites came, we moved to the desert. That's what they said. Well, I'm afraid I was already living in the desert. I had moved anyway, you know. But um, they talk about massacres. Now, I was born in 1952. We had people who lived outside of our camp and who lived tribally. We had a group of them. They used to come and visit us because they were related to some of our family. But they didn't speak English. And they lived out in the desert. And they enjoyed it. The whites found where they were and killed them. That happened in 1956 in my lifetime. Now, these people used to come and visit, and as a little boy, I was fascinated. As soon as I could walk, I wanted to follow them into the desert. I just loved them. But then we, my grandmother take me out of our tribal lands because it was too brutal. And I asked her years later, what happened to those tribal people who used to come and talk and sing their old songs? She said, the police went out and killed them all. The men, women, children just killed them. And that's not reported. Now, you know, the ter- well, we all know what a serial killer is. So, which country do you think one of the most prolific serial killers in the world comes from? Recorded serial killer. Australia. Queensland. And his, na- his last, his name's William Fraser. He died. He died of old age in the late 1800s. William Fraser went around killing Aboriginal people at will. On his own hand, he killed more than 110 Aboriginal people personally. His band of followers killed more than double that amount. It's not recorded in history. But as a child, I knew about William Fraser because the white people, see, we lived under segregation. I lived outside of a place called Charleville. We weren't allowed to come into the city. But when we used to venture near us kids being kids, the white people would grab you and say, William Fraser knew what to do with you black things, you know, because he killed us. He was that savage. When a group of Aboriginal men were let out of a courtroom because they hadn't done anything, he disagreed with the magistrate and shot one of the men on the steps of the courthouse in front of everyone, then proceeded to go up to his pregnant wife and shot her in the stomach. He didn't spend one second in custody. He killed more than 110 people. So we have the third most prolific serial killer in the world is in Australia, and yet it's not recorded in our history. What got me was an Aboriginal, uh, I know, um, Chris Munro, an Aboriginal journalist, researched this, and he did a seminar at UTF some years ago. And I said, that's very interesting, Chris, that you've brought this to life. I said, it was funny. 
I've now got a master's degree and I lecture at uni. But I knew about William Fraser before I could even was old enough to go to school because the whites used to threaten us with the ghost of William Fraser. We all knew who William Fraser was. So how come educated people don't know who he is? Because it's been buried. It's been buried so deep and they won't admit it. They will not admit it. So how do you fight? And this was, um, talk, before we enter into treaties, I put on Facebook often, I've actually got a clip on Facebook, an anti-treaty uh, thing. Um, before we can enter into treaties, before we can enter into anything like that, we must have the truth being told and we must have equity in this society before we can talk to it. At the moment, why would I talk to any government who's genocidal by nature? Why would I talk to any government who perpetrates lies? Why would I have faith in an education system that says, yeah, the colonisers come, they took over the land, they did this, they did that, but they don't tell you the violence they perpetrated upon us. They don't tell you. It's absolutely disgusting. Yeah, anyway, <laughs> me going off again. Yeah. Thank you very much. We really appreciate your yeah. time. Are you all from Nepal? Is everybody from Nepal or where are you all oh, from? I'm from Ghana, West Africa. Ghana, I love Ghana. I haven't been there, but I have, in Sydney, I have a lot of Ghana, uh, friends from Ghana yeah. and they're all cool. Yeah. They're all I'm cool. Also cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I noticed one thing. Ghana men like to dress very snappy, very snappy dresses. Yeah. I've seen some men in suits from Ghana that are absolutely amazing. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's um yeah. It's always good to uh, meet people from other cultures. Yeah. Thank you very much. And Nepal, is everybody else from Nepal, are they? Yeah. 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 Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. Except except the cool guy from Ghana. <laughs> yeah. We all are from this one. Okay. Yeah, we'll see. If you want fashion tips you have to go to a person from Ghana, you know. So I just if you want to, oh, if you want to be a step closer to nature, be to ne just go to Nepal. Yeah, I'll have to go, do more Google search in Nepal, but I've seen some images from there. It's beautiful. You know? it's absolutely beautiful. You will beautiful. find different. Yeah, you will find beautiful places to be, like to go, and then the Mount Everest, the tallest of all mountains, yeah. it's in Nepal. It's all, it's all yeah. like a proud, proud moment, you know. Just to say that. The only reason I'd ever want money, because I don't like money, I think it's ridiculous. The only reason I'd ever want money would be to travel all over the world and to sit in some of these places that are beautiful. That's all I'd want. Because I'm at that age now where I can put my feet up. The activism now, I'm almost 68, so the activism has to come from younger ones now. So, I mean, I've got a couple of years left in me. I'll be back in Sydney and I'm going to try and start another movement going, um, anti-racism movement. I'm going to try and put something in. I want to start a little training school for potential activists. Because I see some of our young ones have been guided the wrong way. They've been guided the wrong way. You can't see my philosophy on activism. You can be as radical as you like. You can be extreme as you like. You can be as hard hitting as you like. But you never, ever start from the place of hatred. You don't even hate your enemy, despite what they've done to you. You cannot hate them because then you're coming from their base. Their base is hatred. The very reason you're oppressed is because of their hatred. If you start your struggle from that base, you will become them. And that's what you can't become. You can't become them. So, it does, you know, in my life, I've been very confronting sometimes. I've been very out there. Put it, put it this way, I've been very out there, but I've never gone from a base of hatred. And the other thing is, hatred should be an alien thing to our nature. It should be very alien. And the only, the only reason it exists is because I think people have some sort of abnormality that makes them hate. So, and I, that's what I want to teach young ones. If you, if you go from the, if you go from a point of hatred, two things you'll do, you'll destroy yourself and you'll become like them. But you will miss out on so many people that you think because they're not Aboriginal, that they're against you, you'll miss out on making allies with so many people. And if you miss that, you miss me meeting some really lovely people. 
Now, because I don't operate from a base of hatred, I've actually been, I, I consider myself fortunate. I've met some wonderful people along the journey. My own people are my heroes, but I've met a lot of wonderful people in the journey that are non-Aboriginal. And because I won't go from a base of hatred, I don't take that with me. So therefore, I can see people for how they are. And a lot of people are decent people. So just in, the, in our country, they've been um, misguided by the media and they've been led along by a racist government. But I think once you drag people away from that thinking, you can get through to them. And the proof was that in, I said, 2013, 2014, we had two or 300 people on an invasion day march and we built up to over 50,000 people. So there are people there with good intentions but you will never reach them if you're going from that place of hatred. And people, people sense that about you. So you've got to keep yourself in that place of peace. That's it. Which brings me back to my original thing. I'm at an age now where I can go off and teach people. And not if I had the money, I'd go and sit in the pool for, for a year or so and just cruise out of the beauty of it. You know, that's, that's why I'm here in the Philippines, just this relaxing pool. I do a lot of writing while I'm here. I just, because. Uh, when I'm in Sydney, I can't write because I'm at meetings all the time. Every night I'm at meetings. So here I'm writing a lot, uh, poetry. I'm doing a book of short stories at the moment. Some of them's all right, some of it's a bit weird, but you know, it's just, this is where I capture my little space because I can't get the peace in Australia because I'm always harassed. So I come here to write. <laughs> it's a good place, but it's hot. What's the weather like in Nepal? It'd get quite cold there, wouldn't it? Uh, it's ag actually just opposite in Australia. Like uh, it's just opposite from Australia. When it's cold here, it's summer there, and when it's summer there, it's cold here. But not not uh -huh. not comparing it with the Northern Territory. Not comparing it with the Northern Territory, no. but the major city like Sydney. Yeah, it's quite opposite. So it's like right. <laughs> yeah. So how how cold does your winter get? How cold does it get there? Uh, I think that I think that it's very cold in here. The, the the main problem is like because Nepal is a landlocked country, and then we do not get that kind of windy kind of a vibes, you know, yeah. coming from the beach around. But in here, it's like it's just spread on your face, and then it's so cold, and then you you got like. I think even in Nepal, we, if we just put one cap and then just two two pair of sweaters, that would be enough. But here, it's like. So cold, so cold. <laughs> oh, I remember years ago when I moved down from Queensland to Sydney, I was actually forced to, um, I was on parole and uh, my parole officer transferred my parole to Sydney. So I was virtually uh -huh. thrown out of Queensland, which was, I, I didn't mind that. I was in my Queensland, but I suffered from the cold. It took me years to get used to it. I used to go to bed with about two or three tracksuits on, covered in blankets. And beanies on, socks and gloves. I just was going to bed every night. I couldn't stand it. So yeah, it's very Sydney gets really cold. It gets really cold at yeah, night. Yeah, even even yeah. even the summer, even the summer season are very hot. Like it's it's very hot. It seems like mm. somebody's frying you, <laughs> frying you in the hot yeah. pan of a world. That's what yeah. it feels like. Well, here in the Philippines, where we are, it's um, it's either hot or hotter. <laughs> We're uh, in the middle oh, of summer now. Okay. And it is, wow. it's really, that's why I, see, I, like the, that's yeah, why I had it, and I was like, it's so cold here, how could you just manage <laughs> to? <laughs> you can't even wear a shirt here, because it's so, it's so hot. I've got two fans going here, I've got two fans on me, and I'm still sweating. It's just terrible. But, I mean, I exercise here quite regularly, but I've got to watch myself. I've got to drink a lot of water, and a lot of water while I'm exercising, because you lose too much body fluid, you know, so I'm out in the yard, exercise, everyone thinks I'm dark riding mad because I had to, I'm out doing exercise in the extreme heat, but I fill myself up full of water, it's all right. But you got to look after yourself when you get a bit older. So, yeah. Mm. Mm. There we go. So where, um, where do you all stay over there? Where, where is all at? Uh, which college are you at? Uh, we study. We all are from Australian College of Applied Psychology, and that's in Town Hall. Oh, yeah, uh, I know where it is. Yeah. Yeah. And yes, we, yeah. we all are from there. And uh, yeah, because, uh, as you know, that we are talking to you, we wanted to know, like, we wanted to know about the facts and figures. And then, you know, some 
uh, something that we saw in the figures, something that we studied in the articles that engrossed us to mm -hmm. find out somebody who could talk to us, share the experience, and then bring out to the uh, bring those uh, things out that can be identified to understand the real Aboriginal people and then their real stress, you know, the everything, the real mm -hmm. situations rather than something that's written in a book and something like that. So yeah, you've it's been a very right good right. example. Thank you. You have been a very good I've example heard. to talk to. I went in my first protest march in 1966. I don't think your parents would have been born then. <laughs> yeah, 1966, I went in my first protest march. I was very young. I was, uh, I was nearly 14, and uh, it was pretty. It was pretty intense. It was very intense. Uh, but you know, that's a lifetime of activism, and uh, I don't regret it. I don't regret it. I know when I was young. The elders all said to me, if the police get hold of you for any charge, you'll do a long time. <laughs> the, uh, the courts will not treat you favourably, you know. And they were right. So, yeah. And, uh, but you can't have those regrets because, yeah, I did things that were extreme. Like I got locked away for armed robberies and that. But um, I, <clears throat> I maintained in court, while I got a heavy sentence, I maintained in court that I was actually un uh, acting under the warfare. That I, I was taking their money from their banks as an act of war. <laughs> and, uh, they didn't like that. They sort of, yeah, they hassled me over that. But, yeah, you don't go into a court of law in Australia and say well, we're at war. You just don't do it. And I was still a kid, but I got, uh, I got some um, bad things happening because I had that stand. And I demanded while I was in the prison system to be treated as a prisoner of war. They didn't like that neither. But that, in the long run, they ended up putting me in that cage for a long time, so yeah, but that was all right. So I survived it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Thank you. Our time is up. Show me your shirt. Really Show me your shirt. Your time. Before you go, I want to. Before you go, I want to see your shirt. I want to see your shirt. My shirt. I want to see. It. Yeah, I want to see if you come up to the Ghanaian standard. <laughs> of, oh yeah, yeah, you do come up to the Ghanaian standard <laughs> of really. Smooth dress thing. Thank really you. Smooth. Thank so you. There you go. When I see my Ghanaian friends in Sydney, I'll say, Well, I met another one, another Ghanaian gentleman, and he's a fashion king. <laughs> I think I think now now you would rather prefer a hot Ghana guy rather than a cool Ghana guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> oh, they were uh, all my friends there, they're all right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, sir, on behalf of the members in the group, we thank you very thank much. Thank you, brother. We appreciate your time. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Thank you. And I, I, hope this is, I hope this has been beneficial towards you, okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you for speaking you with us. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, yeah, Take have a, have a great stay. Have a, have a great stay. And then, yeah, see you if you ever come to Australia. Let's... We will, we we look forward to meet you as well because it's been so overwhelming well, to listen to your experiences. Okay, keep in contact. <laughs>